View from the Gutters, episode 60. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss the Frank book, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 108.55. All right, welcome to the show, episode 60. Hi, Major Chard. Let's do this. <laughs> I am Joe Preddy, and I agree we should do this. I'm Kerbotron2000, and I'm ready to do this. Yeah. I'm Tobias Panchin, and I am fearful of doing this. All right, and? And I'm Cade Reynolds. And? <laughs> I have no fucking glue. And all right, welcome to the show, everybody. Um, we are going to talk about uh, Frank, the Frank book. We're going to talk about the Frank book. And if we seem low energy, it's because we helped a friend move today. <laughs> <laughs> Podcast uh, favorite Matt McGinnis uh, moved into a new apartment today. He did. And, um, Associate contributor Matt yeah. McGinnis. Uh, Podcast original. Yeah. Founding that's member. True. That's, That's that he too. is on the billing as. That's what I put him at. Uh, founding. founding member, founding yes. father. Um, he, uh, yeah, he moved into an apartment, so we moved a lot of furniture today. And yes, I've been drinking caffeine nonstop since then, so hopefully it kicks in midway through this episode, and I just talk forever really fast like this. Um, but, <laughs> as we go, you pick up speed. Yeah, so eventually so you, you can. I as I'm editing, I can tell the episodes where I've had caffeine before. Because I talk way more on those episodes. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to like take some caffeine before we recorded because I feel like it would make me more peppy. But yeah. it just made me hyper enough that I could not quite collect my thoughts. It was uh, just too much going on at once. I just will talk forever after I've had a cup of coffee right before the show. I need to not do that. So I'm drinking you never tea. Do that. I'm drinking tea. That's the mellow caffeine. So tea is the mellow caffeine. Yeah. Uh, Joe, true. you recommended this book. I did. Would I did. Would you like to talk a little bit about your, um, I guess, because you've read this before. Yes. Yeah. Um, a couple times. Would you like to talk about your rereading of it a little bit? Yeah, I think um, I rereading it, I, I'm just struck by... Uh, well, I think it was a much, I don't want to say a better experience, but it was a different experience because the first time I read it, it's easy to be assaulted by everything that's going on. And this time I could just sit down and read it and kind of take it all in. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I really, really like this. I love this book. Uh, even though at times I'm all like repulsed by it and mm -hmm. I am... Uh, it is very disturbing at times, but I mean, there is at no point do I read this and think this was a throwaway thing. Like mm -hmm. every story in this book is drawn with care and with thought and very deliberately. Um, and I just think, I just think it's an incredible work. I think Jim Woodring is an amazing cartoonist and I, I his art in this floors me. Yeah. Like just the attention to detail in it is really astounding. Um, I really like it because I think as we've talked about before, it allows the reader to kind of put a lot of themselves into it. And so therefore kind of what you're going to get out of it is going to be a lot different. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, I mean, I for me, that's one of the things I love about art in general is interpretations. And the, mm -hmm. the great thing about this is that it really, uh, the most successful interpretations I've gotten out of it was when I was talking about it with a group and just mm -hmm. kind of saying, what about this imagery? What about this particular image or this visual? Or mm -hmm. And... Um, it's it's just an astounding work as far as I'm concerned, and I I'm really excited to talk about it tonight. Despite yeah. my mellow demeanor, I'm really I'm really very excited to talk. On the about inside, it. Uh, on the inside, I'm excited. On the yeah. outside, I'm like sore and old. Yeah. So, uh, but um, yeah, I think there's a few there's a few stories that always kind of stick with me. I think. Yeah. But I really enjoy all of them. 
Is one of them the one where Manhog like learns manners? Yeah, I, I, that is maybe my favorite. Story. I think that great. that yeah. might be my favorite story because I am simultaneously infinitely fasted, fascinated by and hugely repulsed by Manhog. Oh, yeah. me too. He is mm-hmm. frightening. Yeah, he freaks the shit out of me. Like in everything that he's in, he is just horrible. Well, yeah, he's and so yet like there's lumpy this... and oh yeah, just, <laughs> yeah, that's so a good word. <laughs> creepy. Yeah. So, but there's there's an aspect of him that kind of has this element of higher aspiration. Like, yeah, he has this. He has the ability to be good, right? And the fact that he like actively refutes that makes him so much more evil. Well, and also, I I found him sympathetic, and I was like, why? He's just such a dick. Like, it took me a while to figure out why I found him sympathetic. And as I was reading the stories, I discovered it's like he's never... It never seems like he's satisfied with what he's doing. Like, these are just actions that he is carrying out because he wants something better. Like, he's often stealing from Frank. That's, like, a a lot of what happens. Or he's, you know, um, he's trapped in these situations where he just wants to to get away and better himself. Or, um, I don't know. Just You can tell he doesn't want to be... I think in he's the, in the yeah. situation he's in. I think he's jealous of Frank. Like yeah. there's one where Frank's like having a picnic and Manhog's mm-hmm. like in the bushes and he just like pulls out the yeah. thing and then like Frank gets back oh, at just, him yeah, and just yeah. the picnic. Yeah, yeah so well he was left out. Yeah, and all he the other kinda... animals were there like hanging out having a good time at the picnic with Frank and he wasn't invited. Yeah. It was like a very human reaction. It was like he was jealous, so he crushed some stuff. And then later, Frank, like, drives a nail into That's his That's awful. Ear I don't like I that. Like, oh. Yeah. It seems to me, upon rereading this, that Frank is very much an empty vessel. Like, yeah. his react, he, 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 there is very little, <coughs> he seems to be motivated by incredibly simple things, but for the most part, everything that happens to him is, is, like, experiential, right? Like, he's mm. just there reacting to things as they come so he'll want this thing that he sees or he'll interact with this thing that comes along yeah and man pig seems much more human because he has reactions to things like it seems like and the, the whole thing with the unifactor which is the place where frank lives is it well it's the entire universe it's the well yeah mm-hmm. it's, the, it's the entire universe and it provides everything for frank and all it asks for in return is that frank experience it and so i wonder I really found myself wondering this time, what if Man Pig is not part of Frank's experience? What if Frank it's, it's is Man Hog? Man Hog, I'm sorry. Which man is hog. so much worse. Yeah, <laughs> no, it absolutely is. Yeah. Um, uh, it reminds well, me of the... Nid Hog. <laughs> which I don't I, know if anyone's played that game, but it's great. I find myself wondering if Man Hog is a remnant of his own. If maybe at one point he was. Sim- more similar to Frank in one place where he was the empty vessel yeah. and now because definitely with well, with Pupshaw and Pushpaw and even Wim seem much more kind of like I hate Wim uh, Me too. they seem much more of creepy. the unifactor than Manhog does Manhog yeah. does not seem to be cut from the same cloth as, yeah he seems out of place group. and I, I do think though that Frank has real desires. Like, he does want things. Like, uh, after he breaks the statue in the first story in the book, he pays off the, um, he pays off his loan, basically. Yeah, he yeah. owes them, but they refuse, they don't take it because they're like, oh, you did something. Your actions were better. Like, you made up for it by getting rid of this weird stuff that was going on. And so he gets to keep all that money. And he goes and buys like a huge house with it. Right, like mm-hmm. he is greedy. Like he has desires. The the um the series where he uh, keeps seeing the well with the mm, eyeballs yeah. on it in his dream, uh, and he's like, "I want that well. I want the well. I want to go in the well." And then he like gets in it, and it's really weird. Yeah, and well, then yeah. Pupsha has to come say it. Like he has he has motivation. He's I, I, not I just think that wandering. it's that he's without pretension or presupposition yes mm. like he had he, he assumes nothing he just kind of enters into a situation 
and reacts to it without any sort of preconceived notions yeah. about yeah. it. He's not without desire much... or any of the baser emotions. It's that when he leaves his house in the morning, it is to literally just walk until well, but something... But how much of that is due to the fact that the comic's wordless? Like, how much is that actually his action or just the, that we don't know his motivation? You know, because the difference between him walking out the door in his house and us receiving no narration versus the narration saying, Frank left his house this morning to go find food to feed his family. Like, those are very different. And because we don't have any narration, like... Well, when do we ever see him do anything proactive? Yeah, that's Well, he has a of... picnic with his friends. He buys weird stuff from the chicken dude. What's the chicken's name? The Jerry the Chicken. Jerry Chicken's. Mm -hmm. Like, well, it seems more like he walks by the Jerry Chicken and the, yeah, and the, yard sale and yeah. sees a thing, and he's like, "Oh, I want that thing." Yeah, yeah. he is. He's definitely reactionary in a lot of books, but um, yeah, there's definitely there's an element of exploration with him, uh, like as if he's seeing the world new for the first time every day he leaves his house. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that also leads to. I'm not sure what order these stories were published in. Um, I'm. Because you I know, think they're close to chronological, but they, the first Frank story ever written is at the end of the book. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just kind of makes me think like, oh, you know, we are kind of supposed to assume that each story is independent. Like much in the way that in the early episodes of South Park, Kenny would die at the end of every yeah, episode. Exactly. And you were just supposed to assume that it didn't matter. Well, and I've always felt that that fits in. I, I, I feel that the unifactor is something that is kind of renews itself. I don't I don't feel as if time progresses in the same way. Yeah, well because I mean it had a sort of purgatory vibe to yeah, it. Oh, definitely. Exactly. Yeah. Like this is the purgatory of the cartoon universe. Yeah. And one well, thing oh. Go ahead. So this time reading through it again because I had read it before. Mm -hmm. I noticed something about Frank, and this might be true or not true, but he tends to fall asleep a lot. Like in yeah. the one where Manhog is like turns into a gentleman, like he uh -huh. invites Frank over and then he leaves, and Frank falls asleep. Yeah. So part of me kind of wonders if this is kind of like his dream world of him uh -huh. wandering around because it is very like whimsical and dreamy. And going back to the Manhog thing too, like um, I kind of associated that with something in a dream that's kind of like negative like yeah. i used to have dreams all the time where like sharks would chase me like that was like my dream mm -hmm. and then um it just seemed very similar to those dreams that i would have like that where yeah. it would be like there was a thing and i didn't like it it's just kind of like there and i would try to get away from it or i would try to confront it and things like that so it's kind of like a nameless shapeless evil yeah, it exactly. Just like embodies the negative space of the unifactor. Yeah, so that's kind of what I got from it reading it again. Is mm -hmm. I noticed that Frank would like fall asleep a lot, and it was all kind of like you know the whimsical, dreamy, and kind of how like when you start off a dream, you kind of one place, and you kind of somehow move somewhere else. And sometimes, sometimes you have goals, sometimes you don't. Sometimes like something happens to you, and you yeah. have to kind of react to it and things mm -hmm. like that. So. That's kind yeah. of the way I looked at it this time, reading through it. It definitely feels like Frank is, like, everything in the Unifactor isn't just providing for him, but it's standing in the way of Frank exploring it. Mm -hmm. Like, there's lots of times where he'll come upon stuff that, like, doesn't feel like it needs to be in the Unifactor, like walls or weird train tracks that are carrying the jugs of whim from play. Mm -hmm. Like, the Unifactor doesn't really have particular rules for operating. But a l almost everything in the world could be an obstacle to Frank. Well, I um, I was talking to Joe on Saturday, mm -hmm. and the comment that I made to him at that time was my sense of Frank is that – so, like, you know how in – Cthulhu mythos stories like a big part of that is going insane and it's not just right. that you're going insane but that you have your kind of like limited human consciousness and that's opened up to this incredibly inhuman yeah greater universe that does not constrain itself to what we think of sense or reason or logic yeah the physical but that 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 there. place of madness is like the greater truth right and that's what drives you insane yeah and i feel like frank is the kind of cartoon that people from the cthulhu universe would make after they've gone insane 
Well, and also there's a lot of similarities because Frank often will like look through tiny holes in the sky of the universe and mm-hmm. see just madness. Yeah. And uh, I love it anytime he like jumps in a well or like uh, goes through a little hole in the ground or whatever. And the universe is like, there's no ground anymore. He's just kind of floating and there's this weird like ribbony creatures with eyes and stuff everywhere. A lot of eyes. In yeah. this series, lots of weird head shapes and eyes. And radially symmetrical oh, objects. Yeah. With like writhing tentacles on them or multiple eyes. Yeah. I, but really, like, uh, they remind me of the patterns on the monsters in uh, Real Monsters. <laughs> Yeah, like they are just bit. yeah they're just like very colorful and uh geometric patterns as far as like skin design go. They don't look like yeah. stuff in nature. Like you don't see a frog that has like a zigzag pattern on it. No, yeah. no, that right? that's very much Jim Wood rank. Yeah. Right? That is just There it's very cool. Like the 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 creatures have very geometric skin coloration. Yeah. And that, I think that that lends itself well to the otherworldliness of what those creatures are like yeah. when whim has him like fishing through the uh-huh. hole in the sky yeah yeah whim is really weird i, I want to know what you guys think of Wim, Wim is to me the most unsettling character I agree. in in this story because and i think the fact that his name is whim is is quite is quite telling because I like that they don't tell you that he, until the end of the book. Yeah, you know, because no, they, there's that panel that's like, "This is how Wim sees I'm, the world," and I was like, "Who the fuck is Wim?" We actually, um, when we read this, we I read it for a class. Mm-hmm. We were instructed to certain to not to read it in order, so yeah. we did not know who anybody was. Yeah, uh, a, a, upon I would, our first reading, I would recommend that too. Yeah, and I definitely, I definitely recommend that. But Wim to me seems to be. I, I I think it's interesting that Frank comes upon, uh, I think it's Pupshaw, uh, Jer- the Jerry Chicken is giving him away. Mm-hmm. And that becomes a very, like, powerful ally for Frank because he gets his ass out of a lot of trouble. And well, then Pupshaw's way more powerful than Let's On. Well, yeah, exactly. And then Pupshaw meets Pushpaw, and they kind of hang out. And Pushpaw definitely saves Frank's ass a few times as well. Yeah. But then one of the people they're saving him from is Wim, who just seems to be like, oh, you want this? Sure, here, have it. He's like, I, I, Wim, is, he's like the monkey's paw, right? He's like, I'm going to give you what you want, but I'm not going to tell you nearly, I'm not going to tell you anything about it. Also, the weird head-changing crank. Yeah. It like changes the people's head shapes and stuff it's just it's bizarre stuff and i'm trying i don't i mean like the whim has no discernible motivation for me yeah like he is very much a part of the unifactor absolutely where he just exists yeah and then his actions are you know just the actions well, of, of an I existence feel almost as if he's there to inspire the inhabitants like Frank and Manhog to their basest, like core concept. You see, Wim is separate from Frank and Manhog in terms of their relative positions within and, and the universe. Absolutely, I I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. You think he's like a player in the game that like knows more of the rules than everyone else? Like he's I also kind of living in the Unifactor. Yeah, I mean, I kind of got the sense that Wim was, in a sense, contained within the Unifactor, and he always seems to be experimenting with things, and yeah. hatching plots, and trying to like accomplish goals in a way yeah. that neither Frank or Manhog is able to do. Like, and I think, in a sense, that they frustrate him. Like, as if. Uh... You know, you we were talking earlier about how, like, you know, Frank, maybe uh, Manhog was more like Frank at one point. Or, like, they're each kind of these characters that exist to experience the Unifactor. Uh, Wim feels like a like a, a, some, a piece that's been put in the Unifactor the longest ago. So he knows the most rules about the Unifactor. And he's also the one that's, like, exploring the Unifactor the most. Like, trying to figure out how every piece works. And he's messing with... Frank and Manhog because he's like, I want to find out how these guys work. See, he... Yeah, I mean, like at one point he has Manhog locked up in a cage. Yeah. And he's just like fucking with him. Yeah, he's just, just like experimenting throwing weird on him. stuff down well, the but hole that's to him. kind of why... 
I guess that's, I mean, I don't necessarily think those ideas are, I mean, I don't necessarily know that they're entirely mutually exclusive because I think that whether or not, I don't necessarily disagree that Wim has been there for a while, but I believe that his purpose just, and I mean, my, my observation of him is that his purpose has become to exploit some aspect of Manhog and Frank. So whenever you see him with Manhog, he's always tormenting Manhog. But when he sees Frank, he's always giving Frank things. He's always like, oh, you want this? I'm going to show you how to get this. I'm going to gift this to you. I'm going to I'm gonna play the head games with you, yeah. right? And But when Manhog is very much... And that seems to me to be... To feed into the character concepts of both Frank, who is constantly, like, looking around and kind of just experiencing things as they comes up and, like, mm-hmm. wants things almost like a child does, where they're like, oh, I see that, I want that. Or I, right. And Manhog, who is kind of a pathetic character, who's always... Yeah who's never really able to connect. He's just kind of broken and sad and, you know, kind of always running away and hiding and sleeping under garbage. And well, like, it feels like he hasn't figured out how anything works. Well, or maybe he feels betrayed as the, well, I always get a sense of him that he feels like he's been left behind because well, he's always yeah. crying well, he like, does a lot of stupid things to himself. My yeah. sense of Manhog is that he is kind of unbridled desire. Mm. Like, he always wants something. Right. Like, Frank never seems to really want things. Yeah. I mean, he sees things and he goes, okay, I'm interested in this thing. Yeah. But Manhog is always trying to take things from people. Yep. He's like he's doing one thing, and as soon as he sees something else that catches his eye, like he forgets completely about what he oh, was doing yeah. and goes on this other thing. Like he's very petty and always looking to get revenge. Like he is a very id-driven character. Yeah, and he suffers because of it. Yeah, yeah. and it's like he is a prisoner of his own desire. He Absolutely. is fucking up his own existence. Absolutely. And there's that like the reason why the manhog like learns manners story is the most interesting one to me is because Manhog like reach, reaches kind of this elevant elevated state where he's more man than hog. Right. And what does he do with that? He fucking murders uh, the Jerry chicken and eats yeah. him in front of Frank. Yeah. Just as a fuck you. Yeah. Because well, he to is, get back he at is, Jerry chicken. Yeah. Cause he's dominated revenge. by his lowest instincts. Yeah. It, that was a total well, revenge story. Kind of... And also the story where, uh, the one that I always love with Manhog is when he goes to catch that pigeon or that bird. He like throws a rock at it and it gets. Oh, uh, that's Manhog goes, behind the face. That's yeah, what I was gonna and bring it up. Goes through, mm. he like goes through the hole and he dives after it and hits his head and gets that huge blood blister on his head and he cuts his leg off, like open and, the, and paints it silver and the, he's on this weird like fever dream the whole time. And I think the interesting thing to me is that that is the only story that's narrated in any sense. And yet, at the most grotesque moments of that story, the author, when he starts to strip, when he starts to skin his own leg, the narration is like, I really wish we could go outside now and go away. And so, like, that speaks to me of, like... You know, like, the horrible things in this book are supposed to be horrible. They're supposed to be... and. But what I was going to say, I'm sorry, I got distracted. The thing I was going to say about Manhog was because of that desire, his constant, like, he wants, he, he wants what everybody else has. Mm -hmm. And yet he's constantly getting, well, he gets killed several times. He's, he's constantly being like, it, it really makes me feel that he was at one point, like the chosen one. He was the one that had everything he wanted. And then Frank came and he lost it all. And so he mm-hmm. desperately wants that because everybody's saying like Pushpa and Pupsha are with Frank. Yeah. Wim is always much more interested in Frank than he is in, in Manhog. And my, Manhog is just kind of um, constantly turned away by everybody because of his own actions. But because well, he's a thief. And he yeah. Is. And like I find it really, really interesting that – when he is given a chance to rise above and like kind of grasp onto his more human nature, 
he's just like he he falls into that base knowledge and he's like fuck you guys well he's still driven by revenge which is the story that i was bringing up the behind the face of uh, yeah main hog uh at the end of the story the the payoff is that he goes and he gets the oh yeah no he goes back and gets that fucking bird and it's i mean like he's so driven by revenge and by greed um that i don't i never get the sense that he used to fill the role that frank filled because frank fills such a different role in that universe and in the unifactor and um i don't see manhog ever having been anything like that because he's so driven by his desires and he's he's almost universally accepted for who he is he's like yeah that's just fucking manhog that's what he does he steals things and he you know tries to eat birds and he's just a mess he's a wreck i find it interesting that we're all trying to ascribe motive to these characters like there is some ultimate goal of the universe that or roles that they're fulfilling yeah where all of these stories like you know, they end in this very indeterminate way where, like, Manhog dies and then he's back again. Like, right. nothing ever really seems to change or progress in any kind of meaningful way. Yeah. Well, and that's that, to me, speaks to, I think, why I love this book so much. is because, really, the stories are, are there because they capture some aspect of what Jim Woodring was thinking or some idea he had. But there is so much room for speculation. And I think that when I, I think the fact that you can ascribe these things to the character, you can ask those questions speaks to the quality of the work. It's, it speaks well, to like the depth of the work. And that's something it's, that uh, Jim Woodring is interested in is hearing other people's thoughts about the work. Like, no, definitely. because you know, everybody has some different takeaway from this. Yeah, and I think that the the vague nature of a wordless comic, like just in its construction, it becomes very vague because we have no understanding of what's happening inside the character's head. There's no dialogue, no exposition. Um, I think it leads to our human nature wanting to figure it out. Yeah, because absolutely. there's nothing to to gain from understanding how the unifactor works because we can never go there. Yeah. Like this isn't a puzzle we're trying to solve. It's just, it's not but immediately the, the minute door to you start reading, you go, what's that? What is this? What's going on? Like, yeah. What are, you want to know? You want to know how it all works. You want to know how the universe works and how the, where the puzzle pieces fit together. I think you can learn a lot about, um, what Jim Woodring may or may not be trying to say about our life. By examining oh, the unifactor, but it's uh, funny that you, that the first instinct is to try to figure out the greater meaning of the unifactor. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things that like I was actually asking Joe to like do the Frank book because of that exact thing to yeah. hear what other people think about it. And I was actually going to talk about whim on this one, but I think the most like impactful story for me was the like horrors one. Oh yeah, this. This one where he yeah. like goes and like the chicken's like killing its babies. It's like, and when, then... Welcome to the uh, what is it? The museum? No, the, yeah, it's the um... House of Horrors. Yeah, mm-hmm. the House of Horrors. And like the it's what's what's the guy with the really long chin? What's his name? Lucky. 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 Yeah. So um, like this one, I don't know. Like this one probably spoke the most to me because off it was awful first of all but um like it's like frank walks around and he like sees these things that like these characters are doing kind of behind closed doors like Mm -hmm. it's obvious he's not supposed to be seeing these things yeah and then he stumbles upon this which is like oh look a scary ghost oh and wins there too which is interesting yeah um the house of horrors table itself yeah some things that are supposed to be scary on yeah and then he's like dude you don't even know what i just saw and i love how he's just like i'm out like he writes exit on the door and just like well, he writes exit I think that on that's, the door to his house that's the yeah. most interesting thing to yeah. me yeah yeah that whole story that like the world outside is the house of horrors and right yes. his house is the exit yeah yeah, yeah. I, uh, I love that too it reminded me of um so long and thanks for all the fish the douglas oh, Adams yeah. story the fourth book in the hitchhiker's guide where wonko the sane has constructed the asylum 
uh-huh. where they go into this house and they come out of the house, except the house is like now inside out. Yeah. It's like, you you just left the asylum. This is the world that I created to escape it. Yeah. And it's just like inside out universe. It's so weird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. and that's the last one you should read, by the way. Don't bother with uh, uh, mostly, harmless? mostly Harmless. What's oh, I thought uh, mostly Restaurant harmless at the End of the Universe is the second, second one. Okay. Yeah. I can never remember what order they go in. It's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, Restaurant at the End of the Universe. Um, Look it up on Wikipedia, oh, people. Fuck. Look- I always forget the third one. Uh, Life, the Universe, and Everything. Yes, yes, yes. yes then yes, So yes. Long and Thanks oh. for All the Fish, and then Mostly Harmless. And mostly Harmless, you should not bother reading. Why? I always thought that that was okay. I mean, I mean, it ends on such a down, indefinite note. Because, yeah, it's just kind of. Neat. Well, I guess I'm not going to spoil the series. Yeah. because if you haven't read it, you should. you should. You should. You should read all five of them. Don't let Joe stop you from reading books. Uh, that's I just a ridiculous. Don't think people thing. should read books that are not of good caliber. But that's for them to decide. That's and not absolutely you. true. If you want that experience, then you should seize it. Well, how did you figure out it was bad? I read you it fucking read it. There you go. It's not a goddamn puzzle. You have to read shit to figure out if they're what good or not. What is up with you and the puzzles? Are you the puzzler? I'm all about puzzles. <laughs> all about puzzles. I love puzzles. That's why I love video games that are old. Um, because they felt like puzzles. Jump puzzles. Uh, <laughs> jump and shoot puzzles. Um, Cade, you've been so quiet. I have, and part of that is because this book is very interesting, and it gives you a lot to think about. I I finished it a couple of days ago, and I've still been mulling it over. Like, my reactions to things keep changing, and the more I think about it, the more they keep changing. Um, I have a couple things to say about this. Um, Shoot. I did, I did like it. Um, I can say that much. Um, I didn't know the characters' names, so I actually named them all in my head before I found out what their names were. Me too. Same and here. Manhog was Piggy Pig. That's good. And his last name was Pig with two Gs. Mm. So I thought that was kind of clever. Uh, Lucky, I, I kept thinking of as Jim. Like Jim Woodring, because he's got like a long face and a beard. Like, is that what in. Jim Woodring really looks like? Well, he's got great facial hair. He does, but like he's got this very like long looking face, mm. and so I kind of thought, okay, let's name this guy Jim. Nice. Kirby, can I see your copy of the book, please? What What did you name the other kid? What did you name uh, Wim? Devil head. Nice. Mm-hmm. That mine was very similar. I was yeah, like, yeah, I always I think like, of him as like a devil. Satan. <laughs> I, I always called him Mister Satan. Nice. Yeah. He just looked like he had moons for a face. For me, it's really it weird because I did, did not name any of the characters the first time I read this. I just kind of I named like a lot of the objects too. Like the, he would just like the, find the twisty turny top or whatever that would like send like do the whirlwind and that the is okay. That story is really weird. Where he's Where in the he, jiva? No, he finds the he finds the the yeah, top or God, somebody. The jivas are so goddamn weird. Yeah. Yeah. You hear the explanation of what they are. Yeah, that uh, is really weird. But no, it's it's a top. It's like a little handheld thing. Oh, and, and someone this, gives yeah, it to him, yeah. and he gives it to pu- uh, Pushpa or whatever, and um, and then it get, and, and it starts to spin around, and they take it from him. And they're like, "Oh, that was cool. Let's give it to Manhog," and they give it to Manhog, and it like turns him inside out and like makes him into this weird log thing yeah. and then they take him to their house and wrap him in bandages and feed him and they're like well he's all better now and just like put him out on the street yeah, but then like, he gets to cuddle with the lake. thing yeah, yeah the thing in the lake is like mating with him yeah he's, they're like he's like kissing a leech or something at the end of that so it's really bizarre I that's, think that's, that's a happy story. story well that's that's every story <laughs> yeah they're <laughs> all super bizarre this is incredibly surreal as a yeah. work yeah yeah I think this has to be the oddest comic that we've ever talked about. Oh, yeah, I could see that. I don't know that it's the oddest comic I've ever read, but I love surreal art and I love surreal like st- storytelling um just because it I want more books to 
and and any work like any book any film any video game like i want them to push the way that i perceive reality yes like because i could have never thought of anything like this that it's actually interesting that you should mention that because i was going to mention that this actually reminded me of an old sf story that my uh my dad had me read back mm-hmm. when i was in like middle school and i couldn't remember what it was called and so i looked it up uh-huh. and i want to read you the description of this yes please uh, do. that i got off of somebody's who, wordpress who wrote site. this uh, it's by A. E. Van Vogt. Okay. It was published in 1950, and it's All called right. The Enchanted Village. All right. Um, it's the story of a, the lone survivor of a ship crashed on Mars who encounters a living city that tries to please him but is unsuited to his needs. The music is oppressive and clamorous. The shower delivers an acid bath. With each drop of water it provides, a bit of the city disintegrates. The man tries to commit suicide, reasoning that his fate is sealed and there is no need for the city to destroy itself. During the night, it seems the city adjusts. The man wakes up to a delicious meal, violin music, and a proper bed temperature. He waddles off happily, unperturbed by his new snout and four-foot tail. Oh, weird. Yeah, it's an it's an incredibly creepy story because like he's going through all these horrible things. And at the end, you're like, oh, everything's okay. The city has adjusted itself. And what you realize is that he has been changed into something utterly inhuman by this place in which he lives. That's cool. And it re- like the Unifactor really reminds me of the Enchanted Village. I could see that. Mm-hmm. And it makes me wonder, with characters like Manhog, like, to what extent are they being shaped by, by the, the Unifactor well, itself. there's an interesting thing. The uh, the paws. Uh, mm-hmm. Push paw and pup shaw? No, the... Uh, oh, 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 the oh, faux pas. Real pa. Faux pas and real paw. They say that that's what Frank will look like when he's old. That's yeah. what the description reads at the end. Mm-hmm. It's a one, it's one line right at the end of the description of real paw and faux paw. And I was like, what? Because well, in my mind... Well, and how they'll wither away as they grow older. In my mind, nothing changes in the Unifactor. Well, like, there's... There's some like there's one where like Manhog has uh like a skull that looks like it's got like the buck teeth like yeah. Frank and then he takes it into that cave where yeah. there's other things which that look kinda like Frank. And yeah. there are the other Franks. There yeah. are other Franks. The the Franks and I don't know if they're the Franks from the first story, but every once in a while Frank will come upon a dead Frank. Just yeah. chilling there. It makes me wonder if there are many Franks and if they're different Franks or if Frank simply has many bodies. Yeah. Or if the day, like, um, <laughs> this is a weird story, but I was watching this video of a video game being played the other day, and it's the, uh, it's like you clean up the massacre of Santa's workshop. Like, Santa goes crazy and kills all his elves. And your job is to, like, mop up all the blood and, like, clean it up. It's a great game. And <laughs> go find is it. Is that Chibi Robo? No, I can't, I can't remember the name of the game right now. But if you die in that game, like, if you accidentally explode yourself with the TNT that's scattered about, or you light yourself on fire or something, they, the game doesn't reset to the beginning of the game. Like It continues from where you were, but you'll just come upon the dead body of the character you were playing moments before. Right. You'll like now have to clean up that body, too. And so it makes me think that the Unifactor, like, you just wake up in your bed, and like regardless, kind of like Groundhog's Day, right. but you could go find the dead body of you from the day before right. when you die. Like, the Unifactor doesn't seem to, like, exist in any kind of linear timeline. Yeah, that's what And it, what that's I what wonder. blew my mind is when it's like, and Frank will look like this when he's old. Like, things age in the Unifactor, which didn't seem to be the case in the stories. Well, and the, uh, the interesting thing is, will Frank be a real pa? Which seems to be a much more supportive mm. kind of influence in Frank's life. Or will be he be the faux pa, which... Seems to be not because you don't, you can't tell them. Like, even in the yeah. introduction, it just introduces them as a paw. Right. And you can't, you have they no way identical. of knowing. But there's definitely a story in which he's with a paw, and the paw seems like, no, we're not going to do that. That seems dangerous. And there's definitely a couple stories where a paw shows up, and the paw's like, eh, we're going to go see Wim. We're going to get, in, we're going to. Yeah, the faux paw gives Frank bad ideas. Yeah. Is essentially that's... what the description says. Well, like. and I I feel like, yeah, I, I, I don't know that it's ever stated so clearly, or if I just kind of want it to be that way because of what a faux paw is. I was also kind of disturbed that Wim is this like blackish, darkish color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the like one color story where he is, because I always pictured him as gold colored in my I, mind. I thought of him as yellow. That's really yeah. weird. 
Well, yeah. he looks kind of like like you moon colors. Like yeah, that's like, kind of he has like yeah. the you know like the um like the moon slivers. Like his head looks like the sliver of a of a, a crescent, like a crescent yeah. moon. That's yeah. what I'm looking for. Um, I kind of like the idea of him being like twilight colored though. Yeah, and I also like that in that page you show you held up the uh, he's looking through the telescope at a candy shop and Frank faints. Yeah, yeah. like it's the yeah. weirdest shit he's ever seen. He's like, <laughs> I can't handle that. Well, there's definitely points in this comic where Frank reminds me somewhat of Courage the Cowardly Dog, where he just like he sees something, and he's like, "Holy shit, that was awful!" He's like, yeah. just leaves. He's oh, like, yeah. I gotta get the hell the, away the, now. The, the first story where he like follows uh, Manhog like through the sewers yeah, and like spreads yeah. the coats apart and his facial reaction where he's just when he like, sees ah! the stop sign and, he and he's just, just like oh runs. my god yeah like the what he saw back there like m- must have been weird or he just freaked out for no reason i don't know it's like he's got interesting reactions to yeah stuff. kate i feel like you had another point you were gonna make right before we cut you off you were talking about uh, oh yes i did um but i actually wanted to mention that stop sign thing because yeah. That is actually identical to an H.P. Lovecraft uh, story. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, this guy goes down uh, into a sewer, and he finds that he's walking down the uh, the stairway to hell. And he opens a door, and just so many images come to his mind that he goes insane on the spot. Yeah. And uh, and that, that scene was... I just I was like, holy shit, that's that's this. That's cool. Um Okay, so I had a weird thought about the the Unifactor and I keep coming back to it the more I think about it, the more some things will make sense and others will make less sense, but I'm not sure and it's a weird thought, so I thought I'd share. Nice. What if the Unifactor is somebody's brain? And each of the characters is like a different warring faction of the different impulses in the brain. Yeah. So, like... Well, in a certain sense, that's literally ch- true, because all of this stuff comes out of Jim Woodring's head. Yeah. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is true. But, like, you can look at it like Piggy like, Pig, or, well, Manhog, I guess yeah. his name is, is like the disgusting parts of your brain. Yeah. And, well, and a lot of the base instincts that you have too, like revenge and greed. Yeah. And and Frank would be like the urge to explore um and like the Jerry's are different puzzle pieces because they're each shaped differently. Yeah. Um so that's like your the analytical part of your brain and and whim or devil head as I called him is like the bad angel that sits on your shoulder or bad devil that sits on your shoulder and gives you makes you want things that you shouldn't want yeah i could easily see like a lot of these um characters or or um figures in the in the unifactor being sort of the decision making process like, yeah. Do I really want that? Well, I kind of want that, but like, oh, I don't really, I shouldn't really spend the money. Like, they're kind of warring in this universe for sort of supremacy at the end of each story. Like, yeah. And someone so, always benefits from the story. So it seems each like. story, you could break it down to uh, basically the brain is getting an, Im- uh, is taking something in. Mm hmm. And then the different characters are interacting to see what the person ends up doing in response to that situation. Yeah. I mean, it's, I could see that definitely as an interpretation because there is, there seems to be always a clear someone benefiting in some way. Yeah. Or someone losing in some way. Now, when you think about the, uh, the pause being, what Frank will turn into though, that does kind of put a different spin on it because then it's yeah. taking him as a literal figure instead of a brain impulse. Yeah. Well, and I, so it's, it's, it's an interesting take. Yeah. I think there's many different ways you can yeah. interpret each of this. I think they're, and they're all valid because as long as you can find any, um, you know, anything to back you up in the text. Like I've always felt like interpreting stuff 
is all about just how well do you know the text? How yeah, many absolutely. examples can you pull up? Because there's there are tons of different interpretations that could be drawn from any number of these stories. Like if you look at them all as a whole, each story becomes so different. But if you just read one story out of nowhere, yeah, with no context from any of the other stories, I feel like they tell a completely different story. Yeah. And I really like the order they put the stories in. This is something I wanted to talk about because we get a color story first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which kind of eases you into the Unifactor in a way, because com- the color seems to make it kind of more familiar, weirdly. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's true for everyone, well, but I felt I more jarred. Here. Yeah, I fe- it felt like it was more jarring when it was in black and white, for some reason. And then uh, the story with the narration, mm-hmm. like having that almost halfway through the book, if not more than halfway through the yeah. book, was really cool, because you had had time to kind of give your own voice to these characters yeah. and come up with the way that the world sounded. Because if I had read that story first, that's how I would have read the rest of the stories. With was would be with like that narration style or influencing the way that I read all the stories. Yeah, and absolutely. So having no words for so long... Yeah. Let me come up with more. Well, part of it for, like, no words that I kind of wondered about, too, is, like, Frank's kind of on his own for the most part, you know? Yeah. Like, when you're alone, you you don't really, like, talk to yourself. Like, they do it in movies because they have to, like, explain what's going on. But with this, you have, like, the visual to kind of... And I talk to myself constantly. Yeah, Yeah. I did, too. I'm weird, but yeah. Um, well, I don't. I mean, like, but you know, he's just kind of wandering around. Yeah, like, he just really has like these pets, but I mean, you can talk to your pet, but it's not. It's not the same. Important, and, and they yeah. don't seem as much as powerful as Pushpa is. Like, as far as overcoming the crazy weird obstacles, like, seems to not be affected by any of the monsters or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't seem to have a ton to say to Frank. Well, Except to, like, uh, warn him of danger or, like, well, alert him to things. One of the few times that we actually do get, a, like, a word bubble or, or a noise is, um, is it Pushpa or Pupshaw that's his pet? Pupshaw Pushpa. is his pet. Pu- pu- or pu- yeah, it's Pupshaw that's the pet. Pupshaw is Pupshaw. the pet. And sh- with, that's the, a f- with the wedge yeah. head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Pupshaw is going. Pushpa is her suitor. L. Not R, like yeah. a dog going R, but L. Maybe it's a Japanese dog. Maybe it is. <laughs> we don't know. Is that racist? That's, that's <laughs> one of the few times that we get any kind of noise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and there's like, well, there's like the little things at the end too where it's just like. Oh, I love those. Like those I don't know. I don't know what to think about those. Like, they just kind of seem disjointed, but I, I mean, they were kind of nice. But... I really liked in the to be continued stories yeah. when it was like, not yet. Uh huh. Not yet. Like, okay, we're done. Go okay, home. Okay, we're done. <laughs> yeah. I liked those. Yeah, that was that was pretty creative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it was cool to just be able to put like one final tag at the end of each story. Just give you something, just something more to think about. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. sometimes they felt a little unconnected and you're like, what? I gotta say, overall, I was pleased with this book. I did. I thought the art was incredible. Yeah, I really love how much detail he fits into each panel. Yeah, and then that maybe because of the size of the paper well, that he draws on the no, no. Out. So he draws this, and he uses a pen and nib. Like right. he uses an ink pen. But does he do draw this. on big paper? Um, I can't remember. I think he might draw on bigger paper, but. And this is the crazy. The, this is the crazy thing about Jim Woodring is that he actually had a specially made seven foot pen that he calls the Nibis Maximus, I believe, that he draws with. And I watched him. I gave a demonstration, and it was the most like unbelievable thing that I had seen of that type because he drew. He just drew a frog's arm. And it was like five feet long, but it started out as this very vague shape. And as it kind of so much of his style is like these these wavy lines in the background that kind of flesh out these shapes that he's not really he's drawing almost using a negative space, mm-hmm. oh, that's which, cool. which I think is really neat. But like, you know, so much of his style is is about putting these little odd details in. Well, I think about how much fun it would be to draw the panels where Frank is outside of the Unifactor or in the what to me seems like outside of the Unifactor. 
the like when he jumps through the wells or goes through the holes and it's yeah, like yeah. the whole page is covered with something. Yeah. There is no negative space. Yeah. But the negative yeah. space comes from like the way shapes form together. Like I just feel like those panels had to be some of the most fun to draw. Oh yeah. And intense. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I just think about how long it must take him to draw some of this stuff, and it blows well, my mind. And I f- feel like it's probably more fun than drawing, like, a superhero book where somebody oh, yeah. scripts out and is like, well, now they're standing on top of a building, and you're yeah. like, well, now i got to draw all the fucking windows in the building, and you're just <laughs> like, you just drawn every link in the chain link fence, and it's just like, some of that has to feel like the most tedious work. Ever. Yeah, and absolutely. some of that they do with computers. They take a big picture of a window. Yeah. And- paste it on and then they do a scale thing to scale it down a little yeah. put it on again but still just the the act of like creating a universe that you didn't dream up that is reality that you're now having to replicate yeah through your drawing seems tedious to me in a lot of ways where this is it's just his unadul- unadulterated imagination absolutely it's like whatever he yeah. thinks of he draws and that's awesome. And you well, got to feel that sometimes he doesn't even go in with a an idea. He just starts oh, I'm, doing things. I'm sure things. a lot of these came out of doodles and sketches and stuff. Oh, no, and, he's pretty deliberate. Uh, well, but well, I mean, hearing like, him speak about it, uh, and he's not only deliberate, but he will specifically like he sketches a lot. Clearly, no, but, I mean like the character designs. Like how much oh, of yeah, it just comes yeah. from like a little doodle that you do. It's you know yeah, while, I mean, it's while you're sitting around and it's I, like oh I like the way that that or even object some of the, the backgrounds like yeah. when you'll see like the wind blowing I I just gotta wonder if maybe he just started putting lines down and it's like oh look it's the wind yeah well and that's that's kind of the thing I mean about his style is that's definitely I'm I mean I can't speak as to the genesis of that style but that's definitely I think to me what kind of sets him apart is that yeah. is is the those kind of squiggles and and those lines when he's indicating sometimes when he's indicating some some kind of movement but other times when it's just the background yeah. he's just doing it to kind of fill this space because it cre- it very definitely creates a mood well every building just has so much character too yeah absolutely mm-hmm. i get the i got the sense that the unifactor changed that it's not a static place. Yeah, like the that's buildings the, themselves that's... are changing and growing and dying, and it's never quite the same place from moment to moment. Yeah, yeah. Like there is a very organic sense to the place. Well, and I, I, I feel that. like, and this is kind of the thing we were talking about obstacles before. I don't necessarily see them as obstacles. As I really feel like, and I don't know that I can back this up, but just from reading it a second time. The Unifactor grows as Frank experiences it. It's almost mm-hmm. like he's. It's like there's a half a mile that's the Unifactor that just as soon as Frank is a certain amount of time down the road, the stuff behind him is just kind of ceased because it's no longer his experience. Yeah, it feels like a like a generative computer game. World, yeah, almost. Right? Yeah, like very it's, similar to it's that. Generating I didn't quite random. get the sense that things disappeared because he well, does find old things. At one point, he's right. looking at a book. Like an encyclopedia, and there's an entry on Manhog. Yeah. yeah. And he's reading about Manhog like this is a history. No, it, I, to like, me, it seems like sometimes when he leaves his house, he's in a part of the Unifactor that he's never been before. Right. Yeah, like, and that's as kind though of w- that more environment. What I, mean. I don't know that anything goes, because there's definitely like lots of right. history. That's what I'm saying. No, yeah. I don't get the sense that things go away, but it's constantly growing and changing. And yeah. sometimes he goes but, to a new place that was never there before. Yeah. Right. And I, my I question totally is that. all that history is that. An, actual history or is that something that the unifactor like i guess it kind of the thing i like the most about this is at the end of the day it really plays with the concept of what is reality what is the nature of the real well, because and time too yeah when well, all that everything space time the very fabric of like what frank's experience is is it his experience and only his experience that he is experiencing or is there actually something there to experience and I think yeah. that that's, to me, the most interesting thing is, like, the Unifactor could very much not stop existing at the points where Frank is not experiencing it. Mm-hmm. And the things that he finds could be the things that he wants to find. Well, we see but, stories with other characters, so we know that the universe isn't completely centered around Frank. Abs- and, 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 I mean, I think that's kind of... I think even in those cases, it's like, well, how do we know that Frank isn't, like, how do we know that... At those points, we're not experiencing it as Frank. 
I and I mean like I'm not saying that that's true or false or one way or the other. I'm just saying that I I really believe that the story allows you to ask those kinds of questions. That's, I've, yeah, yeah. I've always loved a story where when you're done reading it, you're like, well, how much of that was quote unquote real? Yeah, like what? How much of it existed inside the character's head? Well, because it's yeah. all imagine. I mean, like it is all from an imagination. Like yeah. even even stories that seem a thousand times more mundane than this, like police procedurals or something, you know, like, but there's even some extent to, to, uh, an interesting story. That's like, well, how much of that was like the character's perception of what happened and how much of it was like, those were actually the events that happened. Well, and how much of it is that reality? Us. How much of it is us? Yeah. Like Kate on the way down here was like, I think Kirby asked him how he liked it. And he was like, I didn't, like, I kind of got what all the stories were about, but I wonder, I'm interested to know if you'll feel the same way about those stories when you read it a second time or a third time. Yeah. Because I definitely don't. Like, I'm always kind of like, when I read that the first time, I definitely thought it was about this, but now I'm, like, not at all sure. Yeah, and I, so that's I actually I really... reread a couple of the stories because I read them and I was like, wait, what? When did yeah. that happen? And yeah. I would, like, go back because I missed something. And then upon reading it again, I was like, well, that is not what I thought happened the first time. So, And I think all of this speaks to just, like I said, the quality of the work. Like, Well, it gets away from me, too, because there's no dialogue, because there's no words. There's like, I, you have to focus so much on each panel. It's overwhelming. And I have the tendency to... Skim? Not focus on <laughs> anything. Um, that this book was very much... I was narrating in my head to make sure that that I was paying attention. I was like, okay, and now he's grabbing the jar off the ground, and he's like... And I, like, had to force myself to focus, because I have the worst attention span and the worst memory in history. So, like, I just, you know, like, I had to really, really focus. This was one of the more, you know, focus-intensive books I've read for a story that is essentially, like, feels very casual. Yeah. I had a harder time reading it. I still I, enjoyed the experience, though. I definitely enjoyed it more than I necessarily expected to going mm-hmm. into it. I thought it was going to take me a long time to finish just based on how big the book is. And yeah. I zoomed through it. Yeah. Like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and it it wa- like it really did capture my interest. And yeah. it's not just like, oh, well, here's a silent story and maybe you can interpret it in this way and maybe you can interpret it in that way. And there's no really like way to tell. Like, no, I think that there really is a message in each story yeah that you have to dig to get and maybe the message that you get isn't going to be the exact same message that i get yeah but that doesn't mean that there isn't a message there no i agree i think that there are multiple messages for each story because even as you age or change like to go back to this book would be really interesting because you think about the world differently the age you are now than you did probably five years ago, 10 years ago, like things have happened to you that you hadn't experienced then. Absolutely. And so every time I read a work of fiction again, it's like, well, I don't necessarily think that character is right anymore. Like the <laughs> stuff will change in, in my head and just the way that I think. Uh, um, and I think it would be really interesting for me to read this book again in five years and be like, have I changed what I think about any yeah, of that? Like I would like yeah. to, it, it would be a cool exercise to kind of like write down what you think each story is about. And then read it again without reading those in five years and be like, well, no, my interpretations are completely different now. Yeah. It also occurred to me, and I've only read a very little bit of this, mm-hmm. that there are some startling similarities between this and Crazy Cat. Mm. Has anybody here read Crazy Cat? Uh, I've, to us read, about it. I've probably read less than you have. I'm familiar with Crazy Cat. I, I've only seen bits and pieces. I know my dad had at least one crazy cat volume. And I tried to read it and it was just utterly inscrutable to me as a child. Yeah. Uh, And there's a part of me that kind of wants to go back now and see if I can get anything more out of it. Cause it's got kind of that, that same kind of weird, surreal other place where there are these people doing these things Mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't quite make any kind of logical sense. And I I would be interested to see how men, how deep those similarities go. You want to know what this reminded me the most of a short story from, I think it's the Martian Chronicles where uh, 
the human is talking to a Martian and he's talking about like how great his perception of reality is. And he's like, Oh, I can see all this great thing, all these great things. I can hear all this great music and taste all this great food. And the Martian gives him, I think it's one day to experience the world through the senses of another being. And he experiences the universe in a way that he's never experienced it before. And it's like so much greater than anything he's ever experienced before. And then he goes back to being human and he like cannot cope with the fact that he only experiences the universe on such a base level. Right. And I think that that is an allegory to, um, to writing in general. It's like, you think that you know so much about the world, but through reading other things, you learn about how other people think about stuff and it changes your perception of like how you view reality now. There's... And this book like felt really similar to that. Like I read this and I was like, well, I'll never know how anyone else read this book. Yeah. Like this was my experience reading the Frank book. Absolutely. And I'll never know how someone else felt reading it. There's another SF story that that actually reminds me of, and I can't remember what it is, what it's the title is, or most of the plot. And I'm sure that I'll describe it, and then once we post the episode, my mother will immediately <laughs> post what the story was, <laughs> yeah. all the details. Perfect. Um, but the the bit that I remember is it's it's these this team of humans, and they're on like Jupiter or something like that. Uh-huh. Like they have a station there, and they're being menaced by the local aliens. Uh, and they take one of their people and also a dog and like transform them into beings that can survive on Jupiter so that they can go and communicate with the aliens and figure out what's going on. Uh-huh. And they get like five feet out the airlock and they're like, we're never go- fucking going back there. Like we are this, these whole other beings now. And the concerns that we had in our previous lives are no longer our concerns. Right. And they just go off into the Martian countryside, never to be heard from again. Or uh, yeah, Jovian countryside, never yeah. to be heard from again. Sometimes that happens. It's a very, very weird story. There are a lot of weird stories about humans being transformed into other things. That's why I love... Like, uh, it was a very common theme in the 50s, yeah, from what I understand. I love that that era of sci-fi. I always found it very disturbing. Yeah, because it's <laughs> just... Yeah, I, can't, well, I guess it, I like yeah, that. Think... But it's so exploratory, I guess, I w- is what I would call it, where modern sci-fi does not seem to be as... Like exploratory that, in nature. That is an incredibly long conversation that would take oh, us yeah. twenty hours to have. That's true. And also all the modern sci fi I'm exposed to is like very mainstream. So the, I'm the sure sim- there's the tons simplest of great way time. that I can put it is that science fiction was ex- about exploring the unexplored horizon mm-hmm. and the, all that horizon has been explored. Like the oh, metaphors definitely. that science fiction used to talk about things have kind of been used up and now all we have are spaceships and star trek and laser beams well because we understand how science works now and that wasn't necessarily the case when a lot of these older stories well well there there were all these new frontiers being broached in science where it's like every other day they were making scientific breakthroughs that utterly changed our understanding of the universe well even in the martian chronicles the bradbury story i was talking about like people are building rockets in their backyard to go to mars with no like atmospheric containment suits or what they're just fucking building them out of bathtubs and and washing machines and launching themselves to, and like we Isn't haven't even we haven't even made it to mod like that that idea of that was just like it doesn't make yeah. sense or uh what is it um princess of mars how john carter gets to mars he just kind of walks into a cave he psychically teleports and then he teleports to mars and he walks out of a cave and he's like i'm fine i don't need a apparatus or a breathing suit or anything it's uh you know it was a different time yeah now it you was, would but... write you could write that in a sci-fi story now and people would be like that's not how space works <laughs> like i really feel like that would be every comment well, here I, I comes about... the internet trolls oh yeah i talked about this quite a bit in my most recent blog post narrative gravity talking mm-hmm. about how fictional spaces get filled up with ideas oh yeah and it becomes harder and harder to tell new stories within those spaces yeah like you have to find a new space and a new metaphor that lets you tell new and interesting stories well absolutely i mean like that's what sci-fi was in a lot of ways absolutely like, would they credit what was it uh frankenstein right is the first science fiction story according to my father in his history of science fiction the world beyond the hill which uh-huh. if you like sci-fi you should totally check out uh-huh. 
uh, the first science fiction story he pegs as um, crap. What was it called? It's uh, the Castle of Otranto, which no, is actually from the 1600s. It, and it's essentially a ghost story. Okay. Uh, but Frankenstein was kind of like the first modern SF story. Okay. I've heard that quoted a lot, like that that Frankenstein was like the origins of a lot of sci-fi. Yeah, so. I, be- I believe that Frankenstein was in part inspired by the Castle of Otranto. Oh, that's cool. All right, well, now we all know more about sci-fi, and I no, want to go check that out. The more you Because it just reminds me of Castle Cagliostro. Yeah, like if you, <laughs> if you are somebody who has read or watched like modern science fiction – I recommend that you read The World Beyond the Hill. It's like 650 pages, but it That's really gives you a good me. sense of where science fiction came yeah. from and the evolutionary path that it took. And it name checks a lot of really good, really interesting classic science fiction stories that you should check out. I realize that I've read a lot more science fiction from 1960 and pre- before than I have of modern sci-fi too, which I always find really odd. But I love old sci-fi. Oh yeah, my favorites were always those ones in the '70s where they like they were those, those really thin pulp paperbacks that were like a quarter, and uh-huh. like they weren't considered "quote unquote" good enough to be mainstream books, uh-huh. and so they were always just like in the back. In the are those the ones that always section. had the sweet covers with like wizards and knights and like a spaceship crash? Yes, in exactly. The, I love that art more than anything. But I've <laughs> ne- I don't think I've ever read a story where a spaceship crashes in a court of knights and fantasy. Classic science but, fiction artwork is incredible. Uh, yeah, I love it. Because they used to, like, they put out the pulp magazines, yeah. and they'd have, like, the cover, but then, like, each story would have kind of, like, an illustration that went with it. Yeah. I, w- I would just want a van, like, covered in that kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Is that not... No, that's, that's what perfect. I want. That's so, what I want. Are, we, are we done talking about yeah. the Frank book? Yeah, do you guys um, think so. have there anything to mention? one more thing I wanted to talk about. Do it. Um, because Joe had mentioned in the car over, and I wanted to specify what I actually said and what I meant... Um, Okay, so when I first sat down to read Frank, it's it's a big book, mm. and I knew that it was wordless because I've I've met Jim Woodring and mm. uh, heard him talk about it, and so I kind of knew some of the stuff going in, um, and so I sat down with a notebook and a, a pencil because I was like, okay, I'm gonna write down what I what I feel each story is like i didn't expect it to flow as it did yeah and what i wasn't expecting going in was that there are very obviously details that you can't take any other way like when you see him pick a jar up off the floor he's picking a jar up off the floor you can't really read that Unless you want to assume that everything is a metaphor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In which it becomes like almost impossible. Oh my God, let's never do deep artistic readings. No, I I don't want to do that either. (laughs) I (laughs) took an art history class in college where we actually learned how to interpret like Renaissance art and it's fucking monstrous. Like when you start getting down, it's like. Oh well, when he goes through a portal, it represents entering the womb, and then water is this thing. I heard that uh, this guy is looking in this direction, but he's pointing at this other thing, and that's a subtle indication that like he's trying to trick you. But there's actually like a message that's over here, and lanterns represent this thing. Yeah, I they fucking were, hated that. There were all these. Uh, I yeah, <laughs> that I does can not imagine. Not surprise me in this. I there were all these uh, like. And they're not urban legends. They're like, I don't... Wives' tales? I don't even know what they call these. Just wrong information that was passed down yes. through the centuries <laughs> yes. that was like, oh, if a horse is jumping, that means that the person is dead. And if it's looking in one... And it turns out that it's all like, none of it means it's anything about that person. It was all just like misinformation. But that... I Those ideas like went on for a really long time. So I feel like art history from a interpretive standpoint would be very just interpretive anything especially interpretive dance I, that's not my favorite fan. i was gonna say not a unless fan. it's interpretive dance uh there's nothing i love more than interpreting dance anyway okay so moving on to recommendations yeah who wants to start kirby Kirby. oh okay kirby. 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 
Um, Kerbals is, uh, as I like to call her. I, I I've call never her Kill Bill. I've never <laughs> called her that before. <laughs> well, I started calling her Kilby instead of Kirby, mm. and then that just became Kill Bill. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'll take it. I call her Babe. Well, <laughs> that's okay. weird. Yeah, you what guys the hell's are up gross. With that? Well, I already made fun of you for calling her you super girlfriend. Uh, super girlfriend, <laughs> yes. I suppose, yeah, I don't know that I've ever, ever have I actually ever mentioned on this podcast that Kerbo is my significant other. I don't know that I have. I, this is, that's not relevant, really. It's not relevant. You've mentioned no. it like fifty times. No, I really? we want. Yeah, yes. we want. Well, sometimes we actually, Joey's just jealous that he's not my significant other. <laughs> you tell stories and you say my super girlfriend Kirby. Got me there. Uh, okay. Yeah, I just I um. You actually do talk about her all the fucking time. It's a lot. It's annoying as shit. Which is really unfortunate because the reason that I ask her to be on the show is so that we can draw in more male <laughs> listeners because we just were flooded with female viewers and listeners. Oh, they're all over like they. Place. I mean, you get this much man in one room. Like they're gonna so, they're gonna come listening. And I was like, we could, we could really use some more male listeners. So I brought yeah. Kirby so. on to the show, and then you had to fucking ruin it by being well, like, we can, she's I mean, my if it's future for the good wife. Of the show, I'm willing to break up. Oh, good. I mean, oh, yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of us had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I, also, your book. I okay. hate the term "super girlfriend." By the way, you guys. I uh, that just makes me want to use it like three times as much. Future wife is way better. All right. If go anything, on. she should be your double girlfriend. That see, even that's okay, better. Double girlfriend okay. would also work. Sounds like a villain. It does. <laughs> double girlfriend. <laughs> it's like you've got non-weapon proficiency Kirby, and then you take double non-weapon proficiency I'm gonna kill in myself. order to specialize. <laughs> Time to start like, murdering. Chart is done. I'm Fuck done. you. Podcast canceled. Second edition D and D reference. I'm done. Aw, yeah. I can't handle the the RPG talk. One Let's day, go. Chard's head will actually explode. On You'll that be day. talking about math when it happens. Kirby, it will explode what? from the gun <laughs> in my hand. Bring? Okay, you guys, seriously. All right. Seriously, seriously you okay. guys. Seriously, you guys. Okay, right. so what I brought today was um, the Madman Gargantua, which apparently oh. is not too big for you guys to read. No, we've we've upped our size a lot. That yeah. is a big book. It's really big. How many issues? It's 26. 26. Oh, it's under our limit. We're good. I, <laughs> I feel like our limit is 24 with exceptions. Well, but Planetary, 26 is not too bad. Planetary, Planetary was 27. Was 27 I feel like so. if we go over 27, I'm not having it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Arbitrary rules. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So I brought Madman um, because it's one of my favorite comics. Like my two favorite superheroes are probably Superman and Madman. Nice. Um, and. Uh, it's pretty much about like this guy who was brought back from the dead, and his name is Frank Ein or yeah Frank Einstein after Frank Sinatra and mm. Albert Einstein, obviously. Nice. And um, well, who wouldn't get if, that? Yeah, obviously that's what I you ne- do. I never knew that. To be yeah. honest. but um, and I don't know. Like he just is like super like innocent. Like he doesn't like swear ever, and he's just kind of trying to figure out who he was in his past life, and he has like all these. <laughs> friends and like he kind of stumbles upon things like there's a story in here where he like they're gonna go back in time for i can't remember what's been a while since i read it but he's like oh i forgot my backpack and so he goes to like grab his backpack but they ends up in like dinosaur times and like find somebody else who was stranded there and they kind of have to like survive that way and stuff nice also another really cute thing is that in the first like three issues he has the little dancing man in the corner that you flip and he dances. And that was when I fell in love with the story. <laughs> that is adorable. Isn't that cute? Uh, this is all Mike Allred art? Yeah, yeah it's so Mike any, Allred. It's just all Mike Allred. It's I, all I Mike know that and... uh, other artists have done Mad Men at other points, right? Like they've they've oh, done yeah. like uh, side stories and stuff. Well, I think they might have done like the Atomics, which is kind of like the superhero uh, maybe, thing that maybe he did. Maybe that might be what I'm thinking of. Yeah, because... I've never read... Mad Men, and I don't know oh, really? why you keep looking at me, Chard. Dude, I thought you. Why I assumed you had read it. I'm sorry. No, no okay. I've never read this comic. <laughs> I will, I will like, not look at you anymore. Very early on, I saw that comic, and for some reason, I thought it was really similar to the old '90s cartoon Freakazoid. Freakazoid? Oh yeah, because the costumes and I are super. Hated yeah. Freakazoid. <laughs> Freakazoid's great. I love Freakazoid. That's what I, made I me a, pick I this book up. I have a different appreciation for Freakazoid as an adult than I did as a child. But as a child, I hated it because I thought it was puerile and immature. Right. No, of course you were. 
Pure Eye or not. Use words like Pure Eye on the television show. Oh, absolutely. That's actually, I felt that way about Edit and Eddie, though. <laughs> oh, my God, yes. I don't like that Shadow show. Shadow and Pedantic. I still don't like that. All right, anyway. Continue, anyway, Kirby. Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's Mike Allred, and I'm super excited because he's going to be at Emerald City this oh, year, yeah. so I'm going to, like, probably talk his ear off. And, Are you going to get that signed? Oh, yeah. And I'll well, be like, can you do a sketch for me, please? I'm sure that he would love to talk to you. He seems like the kind of guy that would just be like... He's yeah. just, just super approachable, yeah. super nice guy. Yeah, Joe actually met him um, when he was down at the like thing, and I was like in the same room as him, and I was just like, I don't know who that guy is, whatever. And then I read Ecstatics, and I was like, oh, wait, this, he's pretty cool. And then I read Batman, and I was like, wait, I really need to meet yeah. him. Like, I was actually trying to contemplate a way for me to get down to the organ, Thing because he was down oh, there. Oh, the Portland. What? Well, uh, Jet City. Jet isn't City. It? Yeah, Jet City. But no, I, Rose City. Jet City is Tacoma. Oh, well, I know. Oh, I whatever one that is. I can't anyway. so many Straight. cities. Too many. Um, um, but anyway, this is kind of it's got like his origin story and like where he can kind of comes from, so you can kind of branch off from there. And um, are these yeah. published in order that they came out, or what? What? What does uh, this collection entail? Yeah, it's, well, it's um, Madman 1 through 3, Madman Adventures 1 through 3, Madman Comics 1 through 20. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's... That sounds like two mini-series and then the on... Mm -hmm. like the, yeah, the, the bigger one. ish series. All right. Yeah, so it kind of, like, gets him established. Like, the first part, like, the art is, like, super different. Like, yeah. And this is kind of, like, him kind of figuring stuff out. But it's good to read this part because you kind of understand what's going on in other parts. But, yeah, that's... That's All what right. I brought. Sweet. I'm a madman. Cool. Check out some Madman. Joe, what I know what you brought, but yes. can you would you love to tell the listeners I, what you I brought? I do because I'm we were talking about, about it last week. Uh Mannix brought uh a Doctor Strange gra uh trade. And I was talking about uh Giffen and Demateus's uh run on Defenders called Indefensible, and then I walked into a local bookstore later that week, and lo and behold, it was on the shelf for a very nice price, and it's out of print, so yeah. I was stoked to get my hands on it's it. It's a beautiful hardcover. It is a really nice hardcover, and basically it's the team that did one of my favorite JLA runs, which was the JLI. JLA. Yeah. Uh, You've never mentioned that before. Uh, yeah. You're walking home. <laughs> um, yeah, I want you to know that Joe says that every week, and he actually means it. Like, Toby walks home oh, it's, it's, every I mean, day. I'm it's, awful. it's actually sad. I'm it's awful. Awful. I already you, walked home from downtown yeah, one time today. I should do it again. You should I feel sad. It you should feel sad for Toby. But, I, um, I think. This is basically just them... Taking the piss out of the Defenders. It's great. It's, well, the Defenders is an old team, right? Yeah. And I mean, it was like, I think originally it was Doctor Strange, the Hulk, uh, Namor, the Submariner, and the Silver Surfer. Yeah. But I think in, in the 80s or 90s, it became kind of Doctor Strange would just gather up whoever was around. Well, in the 90s, there was the Secret Defenders, right. where Doctor Strange would build a team in like every story arc. Right, right. And so that's what it is. But this is like the original Defenders, and it's hilarious. And the Hulk calls Namor the Little Mermaid. Banner calls him. Banner calls him that. And uh, asks him if he's found Nemo and yet. Ask him if he's found Nemo yet. And everybody makes fun of Doctor Strange for the way he talks. And... Namor is just like, you people suck. What am I even doing here? And the Silver Surfer uh, is on a beach somewhere hanging out with a bunch of surfers. Nice. And uh, it's it's hilarious. It's only six issues, so it's a little light for us. But uh, I don't, or I'm sorry, it's only five issues. But it's a tremendous amount of fun. If you can get your hands on it, pick it up. If you're a fan of any of the characters in it. Uh, and they're fighting against Dormammu. Nice. Dormammu. Dormammu. Yeah. It's Dormammu. It's Dormammu. I've always said Dormammu. Uh, you know, this, this may be at one of the two camp situations. At least uh, they don't say Namor. Yeah, please don't say Namor ever again. Namor. Yes. Did I say Namor? No, I just no, like that's people. No, just the running oh, joke. Oh, okay, yeah, do, yeah. No, it's people, Namor. Like, yeah, yes. I, I, I've told this story on the show before, I'm sure, but Namor is the name that I heard pronounced the most different ways when I worked at a comic book show. Like, everybody has a different pronunciation for that name. And I don't know why. It's Namor. 
It seems so simple. I don't know how you could fuck that up. I don't either. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty... It's, Unless it's, you were trying to read it in, like, an old-timey TV voice, and you're like, Namor, King of the Sea. <laughs> but in which case, Namor still sounds good. Yeah, Namor. Anyway. And Namor. So it's it's a lot of fun, and it's it's Giffen and Demetrius with art by Kevin McGuire, so it looks great. Um, and uh, it's hilarious, and there's totally... Um, what I feel like is a Pink Panther reference, but may not be, where Wang assaults uh, Doctor Strange in his it's bed. It's Wong. Wong? Is it Wong? It's Wong. Wang. Wong. <laughs> you know. He's the man service. All right. the... Wait, a Wang assaults him in his bed? A this Wang sounds like a prison gets, story, He gets assaulted Joe. by a Wang in his bed. Um, yeah, I don't remember that happening in the Pink Panther. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and it's do- it's uh, Dormammu. 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 Oh no, he's nobody's mom. Yeah, Dormammu. He's all of our moms. And uh, what what's his sister's name? His sister's name is uh, Umar, uh, taking over the universe. So yeah, that's my pitch. It's good. It's funny. Right. Excellent. If you like JLI, you like this. Okay. It sounds okay. like if you like Next Wave, you would kind of enjoy a little bit of this. Or yes. JLI. Or JLI. What, JLA? JLI? JLI. Yeah, if you enjoyed JLI, for sure. All right, okay. So Joe brought a book that we discussed briefly last episode, and I did as well. Oh, man. That's called foreshadowing. Exactly. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last week we talked about uh, Jay Farber a little and yeah. the book Noble Causes. Yes. Um, I offhandedly mentioned Noble Causes. <laughs> As if it was a thing that everyone knew about. And I had never knew that other people liked that book except me. I've never even heard of this book. Yeah. And so I, I got... D- I did actually want to make a correction. On the last episode, I did say that it is a sitcom with superheroes. What I meant was... A dramedy. No, I meant that it is a uh, soap opera mm. with superheroes. Actually pro- pronounced dramedary. No, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm done. <laughs> Let's wrap this Dormammu! up. Dormammu! I'm, I'm, I'm falling asleep, guys. No, tell, uh, tell me about Noble it's so, Causes. It's What's like, it about? It's a soap opera. Uh, What's well, about the Noble family? Yeah, okay. Is this so, going to be a repeat of Hopeless Savages? Because if no, it is, I quit. No, it's... No. I actually okay, really this like is, this book. Um, it's basically a family of superheroes. Yeah. But the the superheroes, the the superpower stuff comes secondary. It's mm-hmm. it's mostly a look at their life as the most popular people in the world. They're basically the Kennedys of superheroes. Can, yeah. I, can this, I see this generational family of superheroes that are none of their identities are hidden. Everyone knows who they are. They're this very powerful, influential, rich family. Because, you know, they're superheroes. And uh, it's kind of like their soap opera life. Like, the weird relationship problems they get into. The rivalry with another family whose last name I cannot remember. Uh, I don't remember either. But they're the super Demon villain. Demon babies and, like, the, the, the son of the devil. Yeah. And all this weird shit. There's um, some kind of Romeo and Juliet sort of situation with the yeah. evil family and... It's a it's an interesting story. And people being reborn as robots. That does I know, happen. I was like, in there. Um, is that Mark? That's uh, totally Mark. Is that it, Mark? Yeah. I, well, um, I mean, it does take place in the uh, Invincible. It does, and the daughter in this book is uh, Zephyr, who was on the same team as Invincible. Yeah. When they were in a book called um, The Pact. Yeah, well, and far all of Farber's books take place in the same universe. So Dynamo Five takes place in this universe as well. So the uh, Captain Dynamo, the character that dies at the beginning of Dynamo Five, f- his first appearance is in Noble Causes, and so that sets up another book later. And all of uh, Jay Farber's superhero characters like take place in this universe, just like all the Image superheroes kind of take place in the same. When the faux Justice League dies in uh, Invincible, the nobles are at that funeral in the Invincible book. Yeah. The way way that image handles crossovers is kind of weird because they cross over, 
but nothing that happens in one book necessarily affects it. Something that happens in any well, other. They book. call it the original Marvel style of a shared universe, where it was like it was obvious that Tony Stark lived in the same universe as the Hulk, but they didn't necessarily like interact in all of their books. Like when they um, showed up, it was cool, but they, it wasn't like, right. There weren't ramifications like there are now. I have been reading Invincible lately to prepare for the upcoming long run. Mm. And I did notice, though, that there was a point in which Mark is talking to Amber and he specifically references events that happen in the pact. Yeah. The the team that he's on with Zephyr. Yeah, there have been a couple of times. Well, there's some characters in Invincible that grew up in other series. First. Savage yeah. Dragon shows up. Well, Tech Jacket, too. Yeah, yeah. I never knew where Tech Jacket it's came from. from. They, the way he Tech shows Jacket. up in Invincible, like everybody just seems to know who he is. Yeah. He's from a book called Tech Jacket that was a Kirkman uh, book that got canceled. So I got super excited because oh. Madman showed up in the background of one of those. I was like flipping out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, my turn? Uh, yeah. Or, I mean, did you have you, more to say about it, Cade? Do you have anything else you want to say about it? Um, oh, yeah. I wanted to – sorry. Um, I wanted to point out which uh, books I'm recommending. Uh, I'm recommending we read volumes one through three. Right. And uh, these are the mini series that took place before the ongoing series, because right. starting with Volume Four is the actual ongoing series, Noble Causes, and yeah. the, these first three trades are the mini series that yeah. build the characters. And you can also get these in a very affordable black and white phone book style, like a huge fat phone book style, and it's about half of that first one is what kids are recommending. This series is really long. There's like twelve or fourteen volumes of this. Like it yeah, went on the, for the a long time. The ongoing series is forty issues, and yeah. then plus the the mini series is before that. Um, it's yeah. I, I I was thinking it was actually twelve volumes. Maybe it's twelve. But, but much like Powers, uh, I would recommend tr- reading it, but knowing at some point though the quality is. Like, it kind of starts to... Um, it loses steam. Yeah, it starts to have, like, exhausted a lot of its ideas, and it has trouble maintaining the momentum of that, I think. But uh, that, that happens with a lot of series. Yeah, it's not uncommon. Yeah. So if you get to that point and you're like, oh, I want more Jay Farber, just read down in my five. All right. Excellent. So Toby. I am also pitching a book that was mentioned last oh, week. Oh, Jesus. And I was... <laughs> Very, very concerned that Joe was going to pitch the same one as I oh, was. I know what you're pitching. Mark, I know what you're pitching, too. Uh, yeah. Let us so know. So I'm very glad. Uh, I am pitching – hold on. I'm pulling it up real quick. Uh, Doctor Strange, The Oath oh. by <laughs> Brian K. Vaughn and uh, Marcos Martin. Yeah. The team uh, from The Private Eye. Right. And this is a five-issue limited series that came out in 2007. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe it was supposed to kick off a Doctor Strange ongoing series, but didn't gain enough steam, didn't sell enough. Just it never ended up happening. Yeah. Uh, And what happens in this series, I'm going to kind of spoil issue one a little bit just to set this up. Uh, Yeah, cover your ears. (laughs) So it turns out that Wong has brain cancer. And so Doctor Strange kind of goes back to his medical roots, and he's like, the first oath that I ever swore was a Hippocratic oath. Nice. He's like, I'm not going to let you die as long as it's my, my, in my power to help you. And so he sets off on this quest to find a cure for Wong's brain cancer, and he accidentally finds a cure for every disease that has ever existed. Nice. And some people are not happy about that, and it sets up this whole adventure. And Sweet. he teams up with Night Nurse, and they have like a thing. That sounds it's really cool. Erotic. It's a lot of fun. Erotic. If you like Private Eye, very similar kind of vibe. Same artist, same writer. Cool. Uh, and it's it's Doctor Strange. How do you not love Doctor Strange? I it's don't know. Magamoto. Yeah, right. I love Doctor Strange, and I don't know why. And it's just like a great just, little, the short little Bands series. Of Sidorak, how could you not? Yeah, he's just cool. His character yeah, design the is Ori hosts of Hogoth. <laughs> his character design is just like. He's awesome! Great. He's like great. he just looks sweet. I did as a kid. I would see covers with Doctor Strange on it. I, I think he might be the most underappreciated character in the Marvel universe. He is one of yeah. the. Clearly... I mean, he has his fans, but not enough. I would say Goliath, but no. You're... I would say Triathlon. <laughs> no, the Triathlon is man. appreciated just the right amount. <laughs> 
I think I think that of all the characters in the Marvel universe, Doctor Strange is the one who could best have an ongoing TV series. I, I would agree with that, agree. especially in an environment where we've got so many goddamn like vampire and werewolf romance bullshit. Well, and even Just, stuff like Supernatural, which uh, Ben Edlund's working on, and yeah. shows like uh, Dresden File, like shows that there, are, there are magical so many, in origin, like magical supernatural drama romance that, shows on TV. Is that magical realism? Is that what people are talking magical about? Magical realism. Yes. Magical <laughs> realism is a made-up genre yeah. that was created so that literary people could read and enjoy genre fiction without calling it genre fiction. Because yeah. yeah. they um, like to look down their nose at sci-fi and fantasy. So they created magical realism because it's serious and literary. But it it That's, really is just like yeah. magic. So. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've never understood what it meant. I was, I was like, uh, does it mean magic in the modern era? Because apparently it does not mean that, which is what I thought no. it meant. It's um, just a bullshit term. Well, so, there's a series called Night of the Word that Terry Brooks wrote that I really like and I was like I don't know what genre it's in it's in like magic but set now is that a genre I don't know Terry Brooks also we were talking about this he also wrote Magical Kingdom for sale yeah Landover the Landover series yeah which the first book of which I've read I only know him from Shannara which I've never actually read Oh, I you know I went back and reread. He he pronounces it Shannara, but when I was well, a kid, wrong. I always called it Shannara too. Um, Shannara. But he, uh, I w- I've been reading all of the sh- the Shannara Shannara books again, and man, do they not hold up for my childhood? Unfortunately, <laughs> my, my brother I read really them when I was them. too young for them, and I was like, should I read these? And he was like, no. Yeah, I loved uh, them I when I was a kid, and now I'm like. I must not have been reading there other are books. A couple of series of his that I really enjoyed. He he has a couple of series that are actually a fusion of his Word in the Void series yeah. and the Shannara series. I started series. reading Genesis of Shannara and I'm Yeah, that's the yeah, one I'm, I'm not getting into it as quickly as the Word the Word in the Void like blew my mind. I think that series is still great. But other than that I the Shannara series. I I still love it for nostalgia's sake, oh. but I would not recommend them as great, like, must-read fantasy books. That's so, uh, anyway, yeah. So, that's uh, Doctor Strange The Oath. I wanted Oath. to mention something about Doctor Strange because I've been reading a lot of Twisted Toy Fair Theater lately because it's... As usual. <laughs> ...fucking amazing, and why wouldn't you? And I I feel that Doctor Strange is one of the best parts of that comic because in so many of them, at the end, he will just show up and say, as a matter of fact, I won the day because you team that just defeated them are part of my secret defenders. (laughs) (laughs) And you didn't know it. Uh, So I'm the winner. What a dick. Taking credit for everyone else's work. That's Doctor Strange for you. That That is is... So, what did you bring this week, Jared? I brought a book that has been recommended I, at least twice on the show before. Um, and I'm bringing it because the third volume of The Trades has just come out. And I believe, in fact, it was pitched when the first volume came out, yeah. and then again when the second volume came yeah. out. Yeah. So, this is now the third time it's been pitched. The third volume is out. It contains everything that's been published for this series. The series is on a hiatus, so when it comes back in a couple months, if you've read all three of the trades, you'll be totally caught up to get on issue 19. And it is Saga. And this also by Brian, Brian K. Vaughn. Correct. And... Oh, I'm totally spacing. The inimitable, inip, blah, blah, inimitable Fiona Staples. Yeah. Yes, her thank you. Art, Only took me three tries to say yeah, that. Yeah. Her art is uh, one of the main reasons I even picked this book up. Oh, because art is great. Um, I like Brian K. Vaughn a lot, but there are definitely some like miss series for him in my mind like that I don't enjoy nearly as much. Um, but the art in this like keeps me coming back. It's phenomenal. And the characters that he's created in this world are awesome. If you haven't heard the previous two pitches, essentially there is a war going on in the universe between these two planets that are next to each other. It's a planet. And then the moon of that. planet. Okay. And to keep the war from feeling like it's encroaching on their, those planets, that's like a proxy war. Like, yeah, throughout basically the like they're these two very powerful worlds the the world itself and then its moon uh-huh. and so that because they're like right next to each other so they don't just utterly annihilate one another right they basically are prosecuting a proxy war throughout the galaxy and one society is very based on technology and the other is very based on magic and um 
a prisoner from one of the races falls in love with a guard from the other race and they escape and run away and have a baby together and it's basically their adventures as narrated by their child fleeing across the galaxy trying to avoid the war and everything that that entails and And it's awesome everyone in the galaxy trying to kill them for one reason or another there are many reasons uh the 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 original reason being that they are both traitors essentially to their race by um sleeping with the enemy by sleeping with the enemy and by not wanting to participate in the sweet awesome war that's going who doesn't want to be a part of a war (laughs) right Right, guys right so uh it's yeah it's this it's just just a really cool story and uh the the male character is is sort of uh he's trying to be a pacifist he's he's done with the war and he is very much i don't want to fight i want to get away i want to go raise our child i want to run and there is a reason for that but you don't yeah. find out and uh his wife baby mama is much more vindictive and uh, a very fascinating character in her own right there just every character you meet in the series is great there's uh the alien race with tvs on their heads and there's the uh, lion cat and this lady that's got like a spider body and a human upper body and uh there's just all kinds of cool stuff going on in this i highly recommend it to anyone that likes science fiction or fantasy comics and anyone that's read any vertigo series that they enjoyed that included some magic in any way. Um, and I definitely recommend this to people for people to give to people who have never read comics before. I think this is a great gateway comic there. Every once in a while, there's just like a great mix of art and story that I think makes a great gateway comic. I think this is one of them. So I think this is one of my favorite comic books that is coming out right now. I love every time. It's definitely up there for me. Yeah. Every time one of the single issues comes out, I get really excited about it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've liked it since its inception. I, yeah, I think that everyone should at least take a flip through this to see the awesome art and uh, try it out. Read the first couple issues. So So that's my, that's my rec. Okay. I was just about to ask, are you done with your pitch so I can vote? Yes. Cause I want to read saga. (laughs) All right. You got it, kid. Kirby. Um, I think I'll vote for Saga because I haven't read it, but Ooh. I hear a lot of stuff about it. So. Yeah, you should definitely check it out. Yeah. I'm going to vote for Noble Causes because I'm interested. It's fun. Uh, I'm going to vote for Defense Defenders Defenseless. Indefensible. Mm. Indefensible. Sweet. Defenders Indefensible is my vote. And I am going to vote for The Oath. Doctor Strange, because I want to read Doctor Strange with And that. I'm going to vote for Mad Men. Wait, hold on. <laughs> so, uh, Saga. Yeah. It was saga. Sometimes I don't remember to count the votes, and when it gets to me to break the time, I'm like, shit. So, I wasn't paying attention. We are changing the schedule. Yes. Regular episodes are going to come out on Wednesdays instead this of Fridays. will have come out on a Wednesday. Yes, yes. you were listening to this on, on a Wednesday. Wednesday or later. Right. But... Starting now, episodes are going to routinely be out on Wednesdays. And that's to space them out a little and bit with our back matter. that is the same day that Volume 3 of Saga is coming out, correct? Or is it already out? I believe it's already... I believe it came out last week. Okay. That's what I was... So if you go to your really comic pushing. shop today, you can pick up Volumes 1, 2, and 3, Bing yes. Bang Boom. Yep. I believe that they're already out. And that is what we are reading for next week. Yes. Yep. And then look forward to uh, some Comic-Con coverage this weekend. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Um, we back will be matter. there. Back matter will be yeah, all we'll, about Comic yep. Con. Yeah, and uh, we may do more than one episode. You, we don't know. We might we have a lot know. to talk about. We might have nothing to talk about. There may be our Comic Con coverage. Maybe we went there. It was I. It was cool. <laughs> <laughs> End of episode. Saw a person. Probably not though. All right, we will catch you guys next time. Thanks for listening and read Saga. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title, but like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. 
be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.